Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. Our topic is effective prayer and we're looking in particular at spiritual warfare, remembering as always that our warfare is not carnal, it's not a physical warfare, it's not against people or against nations, but it's against Satan who is the source and originator of all evil. In the last session we looked at a number of people and how they encountered Satan. Eve met him as the deceiver, Job met him as the destroyer, David met him as the despotic ruler, and now we're going to go on to find out how Joshua the high priest met him as the defamer. But we remember in all these things that it is Jesus Christ himself who gives us the victory. There's nothing to fear. He's already won the battle. And then we have number four, Joshua the high priest. We read about this in Zechariah 3. Here he is uh, facing Satan as the defamer. Eve met him as the deceiver. Job met him as the destroyer. After that, we have David, as he met him as the despotic ruler. And now we have Joshua meeting him as the, the defamer. The defamer. He attacked Joshua's conscience with self-condemnation. In fact, it seems to me that the enemy's favorite weapon is accusation along with deception. He loves destroying as well and he loves lording it over people. But here Joshua was guilt-ridden with the accusation of the devil and it is possible, you see, that Joshua was born in the time of exile uh, because he was then appointed to be the high priest for the restoration period. And his grandfather was killed in the captivity of, of Jerusalem, the capture of Jerusalem. His father, Jehozadak, had been taken captive to Babylon. And Josh, Joshua was possibly himself born in exile. And it is possible that what was happening was that the devil was saying, you are a child of bondage. You are a product of the exile. You are not worthy to take this office. And so we read of those dirty, defiled clothes that were upon him. And God says... He is a brand plucked out of the fire and he was given beautiful new clothes to wear. And you and I will feel at times the condemnation of the enemy, but there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We wear the robes of righteousness. We are given robes of royal dignity and we can lift our head high in the presence of God, not out of arrogance, but out of joy, knowing that our sins are forgiven. Don't let the devil grind you to the dirt with guilt. And here is a terrible trick of the devil. He will tempt you to sin and if you give in, he will accuse you for having done so. And it was his idea all the while. He's bad. He's nasty. But we have Jesus, our heavenly intercessor, one who doesn't accuse us, but who intercedes for us that our faith and our strength will not fail. Now, in the Old Testament, we find many examples of warfare. These examples are usually physical battles, but we know that behind the physical battles from the book of Daniel, that there will be spiritual forces operating. And uh, so, when you read the Old Testament, see... In the Old Testament, a pattern for your spiritual warfare. But remember, our warfare is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual forces. We see a number of principles. First of all, in the Old Testament, victory depends upon the right use of God's authority. In the battle against the Amalekites that Moses and Joshua fought, Moses stood on the mountain lifting up the rod of God, the symbol of, of authority, and Joshua battled, and battled in the valley. And as long as Moses lifted up the rod, Joshua prevailed. But when he grew tired, the Amalekites prevailed. And so they had to hold the hands of Moses up. Right use of authority in prayer. We also see that victory depends upon unity. Aaron, Hur, 
and Joshua and Moses were all working together in the battle. And so we see time and time again that the outcome of victory depends upon our unity. That's why the devil wants to destroy unity in a family. That's why the devil wants to destroy unity in a church, in a nation, so he can divide that nation amongst the body of Christ so that he can come in with his stuff. But if we stand together in a united way, the devil cannot stand against us. And we see that victory depends upon breakthrough. Here we have the story in 1 Chronicles 14 of King David fighting against the Philistines. You can read this account for yourself as David persists and goes on until finally he breaks through and he says, God has broken through. Let's look at that. 1 Chronicles 14. 1 Chronicles 14. He inquires of the Lord and he defeated them at Baal Perazim. Verse 11. So they went up to Baal Perazim and David defeated them there. Then David said, God has broken through my enemies by my hand like a breakthrough of water. And so the breakthrough comes as we submit to God and God gives us the ability. He strengthens our hand. We break through by, with the help of God. God. God uses us in spiritual warfare to see that breakthrough. Hallelujah. And then... David has a further victory which completely destroys the enemy and drives the enemy back. That means that we shouldn't stop until we see the victory complete and Satan driven right back and the power and the kingdom of God come. And then, of course, the outcome of this is victory. It can only be victory. It can only be victory. In Exodus 17, it says, Hands were lifted up to the throne of God. That's could be a reference again to Moses lifting up the rod, or it could mean people, uh, the, the people who were fighting against God, the Amalekites shaking a fist at God. Either way, it could be the rebellion of the Amalekites or the prayer and intercession. But what we do know is that when there's rebellion against the will of God and demonic forces are opposing what God has done, all we have to do is to lift up our hands and enforce the victory. The devil cannot stop what God has finished. The victory is complete, but we are called to administer that victory and to enforce the triumphant victory of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a powerful thing. Now, we do need to know that while the enemy is defeated, there is still a period of time in which he's active before that victory of Christ is fully implemented. So Christ has won the victory, but our job is to enforce that victory. That's why we need the spiritual armor. And I want to go through the spiritual armor with you now. Have a look at Ephesians chapter 6 again. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now here the Apostle Paul was in prison as he wrote. And in the Roman imprisonment, he had relative freedom. People could come and visit him, but he had to be chained to a Roman soldier, and they changed guard every two or four hours, whatever it was, and that was one of the ways in which Paul evangelized the Praetorium Guard and the whole of Caesar's palace. They were evangelized because these, these soldiers, I wonder who was the real prisoner, frankly, as the Apostle Paul preached the gospel. Hi, bro, good to see you. Here's my leg. Now as we chain together for the next two or three hours, I'd like to tell you my story. My name is Paul. I'm an apostle. I was called by Jesus Christ, not by man, because I had a vision of Jesus on the Damascus Road. And I'm here in fulfillment of that vision because Jesus Christ is Lord. Do you believe that? Is Caesar Lord? Oh, no, no. We're talking about earthly rulers. We're talking about the King of Kings, my friend. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The ruler of rulers the champion of champions, the conqueror of conquerors. This is how Paul would have preached. And that, that man would have driven, been driven crazy. <laughs> Another advantage of prison is that Paul had the opportunity to catch up on his correspondence. And so while he is writing, as the Roman soldier goes to sleep for a bit of peace, snoring away, and Paul looks at him, and this is what he sees. He sees the Roman soldier dressed in all his Roman uniform. Think perhaps of a centurion, that beautiful red royal robe, or that red centurion's robe, that beautiful plumage, that marvelous shining breastplate armor. There he is. And Paul says, this is exactly like the armor of God. And he describes this armor spiritually, bit by bit. And every bit of this armor represents a spiritual truth. 
And so he says, put on the whole armor of God. I want to say a few things before we look at each item of the armor bit by bit. First of all, put on the whole armor of God. This is a package. It's an entire uniform. You can't just take one bit and leave the rest. It's all or nothing. Put it all on. Secondly, the tense used in the Greek means that you put it on once for all. Now, a lot of people think, reduce this to a kind of mime act. Every morning we get out of bed, we put the armor on. Don't take it off. Go to bed. You need the armor in bed. The devil will come with his deceiving thoughts and he will try to harm you in your sleep. You keep the armor on. Don't ever take it off. Now, of course, when he, when he says, put it on, what we need to do is to walk in the armor. We need to live in the armor. We put it on when we got saved. But we need to live in the armor. We need to use it, exercise the, uh, 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 each one of these principles. And every item of the spiritual armor is a spiritual principle that we must walk in. First of all, the belt of truth. Now, the belt of truth here is, in many ways, the most important part of the armor. Because it was hidden from the rest. You, you couldn't see it and, and, unless virtually all you had was the tunic. Uh, uh, and there you can see it, the, uh, the, 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 the belt. And onto the belt was attached the lance, the spear. Onto the belt was attached the scabbard where the sword came. The, and all of the armor was clipped onto the belt. And the belt of truth kept all the armor in place. If you didn't have the belt then everything would just, all the armor would flap around and there was just nothing there that you could do. So, it's a very important piece of armor. So he starts with this. It's hidden from view. Why? Because God desires truth in the inner parts. And if somebody is belted up, they're ready to go. When we put on our seat belts, we're ready to go. Fasten your safety belts, we're off. And it's the same thing. When you put that belt on, you're saying, I'm ready for action. I am girding my loins with truth. I am ready for action. My mind is set for the battle. I'm ready to fight. Now, the word for truth here is aletheia, which means truth contrasted with error. Truth contrasted with error. You put on the belt of truth and you reject the error. It's important to disbelieve, just as it's important to believe. You just must make sure that you are believing the right things and disbelieving the right things. In other words, let me give you a clue. What the devil says, don't believe it. What God says, believe it. The devil's a liar, but God is the God of truth. So what this means is rejecting lies, rejecting the errors and the half-truths and the untruths. Reject those things and live in the Word of God and take that Word of God into the inner person. There, the truth in the inner parts. And now we come on to the breastplate. The breastplate of righteousness. There it is. This beautiful breastplate. It was made either of metal, molded to fit the soldier's neck and torso, or in some cases was made of linen covered with protective strips of animal horn. But it gave vital protection. Just have a look. Vital protection to the neck, to the organs of the body. The vital organs of the body. Each and every one of the vital organs, the heart, the liver, the kidneys, every part, vital organs, all of these were covered by this breastplate of righteousness. Even the jugular vein in some of these uh, 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 breastplates was covered so that the neck was covered. Now the back had little protection ensuring that no Roman soldier would ever turn around and run. But we, when we stand our ground, we're victorious. So the only way the devil can harm you is if you run away. But if you stand there and say, now I'm going to stand. I'm having my loins girded with the belt of truth. I've got the breastplate of righteousness on. You can't deal with, you can't touch me. I am protected. This is an important principle because we need to protect the vital organs of our spiritual life. Our heart, the heart, the heart, the heart. Our motives must always be protected by the righteousness of Christ. 
we must understand, friends, that our motives are everything in the spiritual life. And if we don't live with right motives, no matter how much we say that is right, no matter how much we do that is good, it is still opening us up to the accusation and the difficulty of the enemy. Now, what is our protection? Why? It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The breastplate of righteousness. He covers all our sin. And it's that right relationship we have with Him. And as we walk out that righteousness in our daily practice, as we live righteous lives, then we can defeat the devil. But the moment, the moment we give in to sin, we become subject to Satan's attacks. And that's one of the most important things to remember. Now, the next item in this uh, armor are shoes. Now, you didn't know that shoes, shoes were armor, did you? Well, you should take a look at those shoes. Here we have them. They were sandals, thick-soled, strapped up to the knees, and they had greaves on them, which are a bit like shin pads, a bit like shin pads to keep that part of the body protected. And in many cases, these shoes were like hobnail boots. Sometimes they had spikes on them. They were killer shoes. No doubt about it. Killer shoes. And we think of shoes today, different shoes designed for different purposes. Running shoes, walking shoes, different kinds of shoes with special designs in order to equip you for the purpose of the design. Now, God has given you killer shoes. What are these? Shoes of the gospel of peace. You're talking about killing and peace in the same breath? Yes. Hallelujah. Because as we trample on the works of Satan, we spread the gospel of Jesus Christ's peace. The Savior, the Prince of Peace, comes through the proclamation of the gospel. And he says you must always be ready with these shoes on. If the enemy attacked and the Roman soldier didn't have his shoes on, he couldn't fight. These shoes gave him strength and stability. He could make a strong stand in the rough terrain. He could run across rough ground, climb over rocky ground, wade through boggy ground. There was nothing that could stop him when he had these shoes on. In fact, I'd like a pair myself. <laughs> well, we've got them. In the spirit, we have exactly that right spiritual footwear to keep us spiritually sure-footed. In every situation, the devil cannot wrong foot us when we wear the shoes of peace. Then we have the shield of faith. The shield of faith. Here it is, the big shield. There are actually two shields that they had, the small round shield to fight off blows. Then a big shield that looked a bit like a wooden door. And often it was covered with leather, soaked in pitch, or soaked in water, so that when, when the... Uh, enemy would fire arrows, burning arrows, which were, which were bathed in pitch and set on fire. Then the water would extinguish them. Sometimes the enemy, in ancient warfare, they would, they would bore a hole out into an arrow, make it hollow, and put chemicals in that. And when that arrow hit anything, it would explode. And there would be a mini explosion, which would bring fire. And so these uh, uh, um, shields were designed to protect from those fiery darts. And the enemy will want to fire fiery darts at you. But when you lift up your shield of faith, it will protect you. And if you stand next to your brothers and sisters, as the Roman soldiers did, you would protect the whole army. In fact, they could box themselves in when a heavy barrage of arrows or spears would come. They would just stand next to each other and build a kind of box in three dimensions, cover their heads, cover their sides, and that's how we should be in the body of Christ. When the slings and arrows of the enemy's activity reach the body of Christ and somebody gets hurt, we need to cover them with the shield of faith. Not accuse them, not tear them down, but box them in and protect them. We need to take care of one another with the shield of faith. It's not just to keep yourself safe, it's to help the rest in the body of Christ. Then we have the helmet of salvation. Now these Roman helmets were made of strong leather covered with metal or, or uh, the le leather covered the metal or the cast metal was there by itself. And these uh, helmets were so strong 
that they could withstand the blows even of the great big Roman broadsword that had to be wielded with two hands. And it's the helmet of hope, the helmet of salvation, the hope of our salvation. God gives us protection from the enemy's discouragement and the enemy's work in our minds. What wonderful protection there is. Then the final piece of armor mentioned here is the sword of the Spirit. As I said, there were two kinds of swords. The large Roman broadsword, which needed two hands to wield, very clumsy, not that deadly because people could dodge it and the armor protected, but the dagger, the short sword, this Roman short sword, sharp as a razor, and if you were stabbed by a Roman soldier, they could find some way in somewhere, and you would be sure to die. They were so clear and precise in the use of this. They were like surgeons in the ancient world, so precise in how they used it. That's the rhema word of God, my friends. When God gives you a special word that you draw out of the belt of truth, it becomes the sword of the Spirit. That special word which goes precisely to the mark that destroys exactly what needs to be destroyed it is a precision instrument and that's how God wants us to work against the enemy to go exactly where the enemy is entering in and deal with surgical precision with everything that the enemy is de doing and rooting it out and giving Jesus all the glory now we see all of that is the true purpose of the armor what for? To fight against the enemy, but how? He goes on in verse 18 of Ephesians 6 to say, still part of the same sentence, still in the same breath, putting on all this armor, verse 18, and praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So what is the armor for? It's so that you will be able to pray. It's to prepare you to pray. That's what the armor is for. It's to equip you for your prayer life. Now, there's so much more that you can find there in the manual and in other places on this teaching. And I want you to take that teaching and develop it and understand that the armor is there for prayer. In fact, there is all, almost, we, some scholars suggest that in this mention of prayer, he is talking about another piece of armor. That's the Roman lance, that spear, which the Roman soldiers carried. Paul doesn't mention it specifically, but it does fit the pattern very well. That that spear is like the lance that once is released from the hand of the person who prays. is like the prayer that finds its target. The whole purpose of this is that we should be skilled and effective in the prayer life. And now, let's summarize all that we've been saying as we bring this session to a close by looking at the principles of warfare praying in the Bible. Well, we see in so many ways that warfare praying is biblical. And uh, we haven't got too involved with confronting demons. I think we need to be led very carefully by the Holy Spirit. And so here are, in conclusion, five stages or principles of warfare praying. Number one, knowing the will of God. There is no way that you can speak to a mountain, uproot a tree, deal with anything demonic or anything that's an obstacle standing in your way of the smooth running of the kingdom of God. You can't deal with that unless you know God's will because God's will is all about God's kingdom is all about God's will. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done. Kingdom come, will be done. Kingdom come, will be done. Kingdom come, will be done. God's will is done, God's kingdom comes. God's kingdom comes, God's will is done. So if you're going to be involved in warfare praying, you must wait for an understanding of God's will in any situation so that you may know from the Holy Spirit that what you are meeting is a mountain that God wants you to remove. You don't go fighting with it unless that is a clear revelation of God. Secondly, an authoritative order. Jesus said, whoever speaks to this mountain. He didn't say, whoever prays to me in warfare praying, you speak, you declare, mountain, be moved. That's an authoritative order. We need to understand it's very similar to the Pagah praying as we saw in the Old Testament terms of intercession. And we need to know what it is to issue authoritative commands just as Jesus rebuked the winds and the waves. Be still. 
There was a demonic storm that was whipped up at that time. And Jesus spoke a word of command. And he says, now where is your faith? Where is your faith? In other words, you go and do the same thing. So you need to know how to move in authoritative commands. Number three, you need to know how to receive and move in God's faith. In the sort of the spirit sessions that we're going to be coming to on faith, we'll deal with this in detail. But we need to receive God's faith. What is God's faith? God's faith is the kind of faith that once it's spoken, it happens. And God has absolute confidence in his own word. And we must have the same confidence in God's word. You can have the same confidence in God's word that God has in his own word. That's God's faith in Mark eleven twenty four. Have the faith of God, which is the literal understanding of that. And then we need to know, number four, that this must come through sustained speaking. In Mark 11, the Greek tense used means to go on commanding. Be removed, and you keep on commanding until it happens. Sustained speaking in warfare praying. You don't give up even though you don't see any change. You keep on and keep on praying and declaring and commanding, and it will happen. So we come to number five. We have the visible result. Jesus said, it will be done. The mountain will move. The tree will obey you. The situation, the circumstance will be transformed. There will be a visible rip. Uh, a, a visible result, no doubt about it, God will get the job done as you take your position in the heavenly realms and move in warfare praying. So much more we could say about this subject, but that is a good introduction for you, and I encourage you to go back to the manual, study all the references yourself, and you will see a marvelous, powerful warfare prayer life coming forth from you as you stand with your brothers and sisters together in today's church. Well, God bless you. That's the end of this teaching session today. And next time we'll come back and look at more ways in which you can develop your effective prayer life. God bless you. And remember, God has finished and the devil cannot stop him. Amen. That concludes today's teaching on effective prayer. And I pray that you have been blessed by the teaching from the Word of God on this most vital subject and that God has been developing your prayer life. Next time, we're going to go deeper into the subject. Goodbye. God bless you.